Hey, buddy, I remembered that last chord there. <clears throat> I shanked that about half the time we practiced that today. <clears throat> it didn't used to take as long for the band to leave the stage. I mean, what's, <laughs> what's going on here? <laughs> Good job today, Brother Mike. We didn't miss Kellyanne at all because of you. <clears throat> Like some of you, a few times in my life, maybe four times, I have spent 12 months, an entire year, going through this, a one-year Bible. This divides the whole thing up in 365 sections so you can read through the entire Bible in a year. And when I did this, I saw like never before how kind of the whole thing, how God's plan unfolds. It helped me to step back and kind of see the big picture. I also came across some rather odd and unusual verses, like Deuteronomy 25, 11, and 12. It says, if two men are fighting and the wife of one of them comes to rescue her husband from his assailant and she reaches out and seizes him by his private parts, you shall cut off her hand. I thought, that's kind of weird. <laughs> well, I actually do kind of agree on the punishment part of that. <laughs> or how about this one, e Ezekiel 16, 4, 40? They will bring a mob against you and will stone you and hack you to pieces with swords. That's not the one you see like on somebody's fireplace mantle or whatever, at <laughs> Hobby Lobby. Or how about Isaiah 28, 8? All the tables are covered in vomit. That sounds like a lunchtime at the elementary school, right, Chris? You know, just... Here's one, uh, Judges 9, 53. A woman dropped an upper millstone on his head and cracked his skull. That's just some of the stuff I came across reading the one-year Bible. Now, there were lots of meaningful verses, too, of course, but let me give you a few more of these crazy ones. Deuteronomy 28, 18, you will be cursed when you come in and cursed when you go out. Sounds like the greetings I get when I ask Jana what she's cooking and what smells so bad in the house. I'm cursed when I... Anyway... Here's one, uh, 1 Kings 20, verse 37. The prophet found another man and said, strike me, please. And so the man struck him and wounded him. Reminds me of that movie, What About Bob, when he gets on the bus and he says, somebody please just punch me in the face and knock me out. Okay, just one more. Okay, a few years ago, buddy, I sent him a little card because, you know, just to say how much we all appreciate his his giving his talent to God and how faithfully he served God over the years in the band. And, and at the end, I put a little scripture reference. It was Deuteronomy 28, 27, which reads, The Lord will afflict you with the boils of Egypt, with tumors, festering sores, and the itch from which you cannot be cured. <laughs> so Buddy tells me later, he gets this nice note and says all these wonderful things about about him and, and, and how much we appreciate him. And at the bottom, by my name, it just had the reference, Deuteronomy 28, 27. So, of course, he gets his Bible and looks up this, what he knows is sure is going to be a really meaningful, touching verse. And he said he calls his wife, Terry, in and says, hey, read this verse that Russ put on, on the end of this card. And Buddy was like, what do you think this means? Why do you think he put a verse like this about me getting the boils of Egypt and the itch from which you cannot be cured? And his wife's like, I have no idea. But the point is, the point is that in reading through the entire Bible in a year, it can give you a different perspective, kind of a, you know, a bird's eye view of things, similar to what we're doing in this series. We're trying to compact the entire history of God and man from Genesis to Revelation into six weeks. The goal is to step back and to see the big picture. So far, we said in the beginning, God created man, and one of the chief purposes was so that there could be a genuine friendship, a relationship between man and his creator. And it all worked really great for a while. But God also chose that rather than make man to be a robot that was pre-programmed to love him and to worship the creator, God gifted men and women with free will. And tragically, humankind determined that they didn't need some God telling them what to do, even though there was really only one rule at first. And so they rebelled against their creator, the fall of man, as it's called. And so the friendship, the relationship between 
man and his creator, God, was damaged. And that brings us to part three of the law. We had the beginning, we had the fall, today the law. And this takes us into that strange and disturbing territory known as the Old Testament. Now, some of us shy away from the Old Testament because it seems filled with violence and passion and despair and betrayal and dismemberment and treachery, kind of like dating and marriage for some of us. But when we get to the law in the Bible, we think of the Ten Commandments, first of all, right, that Moses brought down from the mountains. Those were the law. And the Ten Commandments address some really big ones. Don't steal, don't kill, don't commit adultery, don't lie, keep the Sabbath, have no other gods before me, etc. But there were more. There came many more. In the Old Testament, God laid out his laws in painstaking detail. How people were supposed to work, how they were supposed to live, even how they were supposed to eat, how they were supposed to treat each other. And here's just a short list of things that God's law addresses and regulated. There were governing issues, criminal justice, commerce, property rights, slavery, marriage, parenting, sexual relations, social interactions, the army, the temple, animal sacrifices, taking care of widows and orphans, taking care of the poor. What about foreigners? What about domesticated animals? There were dietary laws. There were laws about sicknesses such as lep leprosy, what to do with dead bodies so everyone else doesn't become contaminated, laws about entering into contracts and covenants with other people and other nations. There were laws about punishment and restitution, prophecy, clothing, taxes, tithing to God's work, on and on and on. And you might be thinking, yeah, but what was, what was the purpose? What was the reason for all of these very specific rules and laws? Well, believe it or not, it actually goes right back to the very beginning in the garden before the fall of man. Remember when it was paradise? When it was just man and woman and family and the animals and all of nature living together with God in harmony and peace, you know, love and happiness. Well, God's great desire and goal is that humankind could return to a paradise someday where once again God and man and everything else lives in harmony. And one of the ways that God chose to do that was to create, to establish a people, a nation through which could be demonstrated for the whole world to see, hey, everybody, this is what can happen when people live life the way I intended it to be lived. Even now, with sin in the world, people can still experience at least a bit of paradise right here on earth if they will follow my laws. Got it? That was the purpose. That was the reason behind God's Old Testament laws. And, of course, the people, the nation that God created and chose to demonstrate this through were, was Israel, the Jewish nation. These laws were given to them when they were still just a band of ex-slaves, just recently freed from Egypt, struggling to survive. And God gave them this kind of as a vision as a goal, something to move toward that God wanted them to realize in the future, how to build and establish this model nation that God was going to use to show the rest of the world just how it could be done if they did it his way. Now, a question you might hear from time to time is, do people today, that is people in general or Christians in particular, are we required to observe and keep all of the Old Testament laws? Earlier, faith read these verses that where Jesus himself addressed this issue in Matthew chapter 5. He said, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappears, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Now, that seems to be saying that all of the Old Testament rules and laws and rituals must still be observed. Himself and his disciples did not always follow each and every Old Testament law, rule, and ritual. So it can't mean that, right? It can't mean that we all have to still do it because Jesus disregarded quite a few of them. Jesus did not abolish the moral or ethical laws that had been in effect since the time of Moses and were explained in detail in the Old Testament. 
In fact, he affirmed and expanded upon those timeless principles and even went so far as to say that external compliance is not enough. It's what happens in your heart. You know, you can hate somebody. In the Old Testament, that's fine to hate somebody as long as you don't do anything. But Jesus said, no, you can't even hate somebody in your heart. You can't commit adultery in your heart, right? He said all these kinds of things where it's like, it's beyond just external compliance now. It's more, it's more serious. It's more personal than that now. It's not just obeying and checking off a list of rules. It's becoming a certain kind of person from the inside out. You know, at the time Jesus arrived on the scene in Israel, in Jerusalem, the religious leaders of his day, namely the priests, the scribes, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, and so forth, had, ex had increased exponentially the number of laws and rituals that had to be followed. There were no longer just like Ten Commandments or even hundreds of Old Testament laws. Rather, now there were thousands upon thousands of interpretations. Well, if it means don't work on the Sabbath, what does that actually constitute? What constitutes work? And they had to extrapolate all of these details out, and it just became from Ten Commandments to Hundred Commandments to just countless different little rules and things that you were just piled up and piled up, all these regulations. And you remember, they became very upset when Jesus, this so-called Messiah, and his followers didn't obey all their rules. And one time Jesus said, hey, I follow all of God's laws, but no, I'm not concerned about all of your man-made addendums that you, have, that you have added on over the years, which made them very angry, which led ultimately to their desire to have Jesus killed. Because to them, the religious leaders, he was leading all the Jewish people astray from the strict observance of God's laws, right? And he was kind of giving a new way of looking at some of those laws and laws that even superseded them, as in, again, laws of the heart. But that was the original purpose of the Old Testament laws, regulating governance, criminal justice, business, marriage, diet, taxes, uh, religious matters, etc., so that God's people, the nation of Israel, could demonstrate to the rest of the world, hey, here's what things could be like. Here's kind of this utopian society. If you honor and obey God, you can have a slice of heaven right there on earth when people live together in peace and love and happiness and honoring God. But can you guess how long it took until the people of Israel botched it all up? About five minutes. And you know why? Because they were still fallen sinners. God gave them his laws, and they immediately went around breaking them. Now, that brings me to kind of an observation. Within each of us resides a law keeper and a law breaker. Now, some people find it so frustrating trying to be a law keeper, they just decide it's easier to be a lawbreaker. I don't care, right? And you guys know me. I'm a very compliant, by-the-book kind of person. If a stop, sign says stop, I stop. If it's 45 miles an hour, I go 42 just to be safe. All right, that's not, that's not true at all. <laughs> to my knowledge, I have never driven under the speed limit on purpose. It's happened, but then I look up and say, oh, shoot, what am I doing? I'm wasting time, you know? I'm just wired up. I've always been. I remember Jan and I one time, we went on a ski trip with two other couples. And so we, we took turn driving because it's a long trip to Breckenridge, Colorado. It's like 18 hours. Well, this one guy, let's call him Bill, because that was his name. <laughs> Bill, he literally drove 50 miles an hour. It, the speed limit was not 55. It was 65 at that time. It's not going to take 18 hours to get there. It's going to take 25 hours. And I was like, hey, Bill, everything okay? I noticed you're only going 50 miles an hour. And Bill's like, oh, you know, no, nah, I just prefer slower, better gas mileage, safer, all that. <laughs> now, if you had to choose one category, if you had to choose one category, your basic kind of wiring, some of this is just how we're born, I think. Because if you have kids, you know they're all different. But if you had to put yourself in one category, your basic wiring, are you, do you tend to be a law keeper or a law breaker? How many of you lean toward being a law keeper? You kind of don't want to mess things up. Okay, 
probably about half. How many of you kind of lean toward being a lawbreaker? <laughs> Slight. Keep those hands up. We're taking pictures of this. <laughs> Who we can trust with the take the offerings. But the fact is there is a law keeper and a law breaker within each of us, and that's because, like Adam and Eve, we are all sinners. Now, over the, over the years, churches, much like the original nation of Israel, churches have come up with their own list of what we fallen sinners must do to be right with God. And you've heard them, like, no dancing, no smoking, no drinking, no gambling, no strip joints. That probably should be that probably should be on the list. Some churches say uh, no clapping in church, no laughter in church, no women leaders, no rock and roll, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And some people out there they think that's what Christianity and church is all about. Here are the rules: if you obey them, God will love you, and you'll go to heaven when you die. But if you don't obey the rules, you have a miserable future, and you will go straight to hell when you die. To them, it's all about laws and rules, most of which seem arbitrary to them, just like, well, that's just meant to have it where we don't have fun. That's what the rules in church seem like to most people. No wonder not many people are not lining up to join churches. But today, I want to, I want to tell you, if you haven't heard, or remind you if you have, Christianity is not a rule-driven faith. It is not a law-driven faith. It is a grace-driven faith. Check out this verse from uh, Titus 3, 5, he saved us, meaning he, Jesus, he saved us not because of righteous things that we had done, but because of his mercy. We do not get into heaven by perfectly obeying every little law. You know, it is only because of God's grace, mercy, forgiveness, love, and what Jesus did on the cross, you know, for us. That's how we get him. Now, I don't really like... To bring this up, but since we are talking about the law today, I guess I will. I don't want to bring this up because I know most of you think Russ is perfect. He's a pastor. He's a man of the cloth. He never sins. He never messes up. Uh, okay, you know, but anyway, for some reason, and I cannot explain it, and I did not seek it, but from my earliest years, I have always been more of a law breaker than a law keeper. It was not my parents' fault. They had six kids, and the first five went so well, they thought, let's just have one more. Big mistake. I never liked, when I was three, four years old, I was like, I don't want to wear a tie to church. I don't want to tuck my shirt tail in. I don't want to, whatever. I, 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 I didn't like the rules at school. I didn't like the rules at church. I was a frequent visitor to the principal's office. I was boarded on many occasions. I was sent home from church at camp early uh, several times. Uh, I didn't like dress codes or hair codes or bedtimes or curfews. I snuck out of my window at night. Uh, I shot my neighbor's windows out with my BB gun. I shoplifted. I drove the car before I had a license. I lied about where I was going and who I was going with and what I was doing. What great joy and serenity I brought my parents as the, the baby of the family. But maybe the capper was on the night of December 10th, 1971. I was 16 years old. A friend and I were caught breaking into a grocery store. We were handcuffed. We were put in the back of the police car. I got my mug shot, my fingerprints. And then I had to make that call. You know, you get one call. It was very late at night at this point, probably 2 o'clock, 2.30 in the morning. How am I going to explain to my parents, my dad was the pastor of the largest church in Miami, Oklahoma, and how am I going to explain to them why I was breaking into a grocery store? Well, it took the next evening, Saturday evening, for them to work things out with the district attorney. But when my parents came to take me home, I don't remember them yelling or screaming or hitting or nothing like that. Instead, my best memory is of them, of confusion on their face and hurt. That's what I remember that they, they cared about me. Even though I had brought kind of dishonor to our family, 
and I had embarrassed them. And obviously something was wrong in my life. Why would I be doing these kinds of things? And that was just the only time I got caught. But they cared about me. And that's what grace is. Grace is demonstrating love and mercy to someone who does not deserve it. And when we say that Christianity is not a law-driven faith, but a grace-driven faith, that's what we're talking about. You know, God is the equivalent of my parents. And even though you and I are habitual sinners, God loves us anyway. We have a hard time with that because when people continue to do things bad toward us, we run out of ability to, to handle that. But God, his love and his compassion and his mercy and his forgiveness is unlike ours. We are lawbreakers, but God's law of love means that the broken and damaged relationship between us and him because of our sin can be restored. And I hope you'll be here next week to hear more about where we're headed after that. Let's stand. We'll have our closing prayer. Lord, we don't understand. We can't even comprehend the capacity that you have, the size of your heart to be able to forgive us. Sometimes we look sin in the face and we say, I know I shouldn't do this, and we just we do it anyway. Sometimes we drift away from you and we kind of push you off the throne and we regain the throne in our lives and, and we still want to be believers, but we... We aren't really living in a way that's pleasing to you. And Lord, we know that we need to repent. We know that we need to put sin behind us. But ultimately, it'll never happen fully. And so ultimately, we have to throw ourselves on the mercy of your court and your grace. And that's all we ultimately can rely on. Lord, we're so grateful that we do not have an endless list of rules and regulations and tiny little details that we have to fulfill perfectly or we fall short and we're kicked out. We're so grateful, God, that you are a God of love and unfathomable patience and compassion and enduring love for us, even when we don't deserve it. Lord, we're so grateful that we live in a grace-driven faith. Lord, today I hope that we celebrate it, that we don't take advantage of it, that we pursue holiness and righteousness and being all that you want us to be. But even then, we know we're going to fall short. And we thank you for your big, big heart of forgiveness and love and grace toward us. Lord, all of us here are recipients of that incredible, incredible, amazing grace. We thank you for that today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, everybody. Thanks for coming. We'll see you next week.